I grew up loving the ocean, but it wasn't until I had the opportunity eight years ago to take a boat around the world that I realized just how important the marine environment was to our life on land. It began um, when I graduated as an architect. I needed a way to get to a new job in Australia. And when I went on Google to look for a way to hitchhike around the world, this boat popped up. This boat is called Earth Race. It runs on 100% biodiesel. They had just broken the round the world speed record in 60 days, and they were looking to take this boat around the world again, this time doing a promotional tour about renewable fuels. So I applied for the job, and the skipper said, come and meet us for the weekend. And I didn't end up going home for another 923 days. When you sail, you react to the changes in the environment around you and shift your path. And I realized it was time for me to react to what I was seeing. So I ditched the architecture job and went to live on a tiny little Pacific atoll in the remote outer islands of Tonga. Looks like paradise from afar, but when you zoom in, you realize it's a different reality. These small islands, where their fisheries have collapsed and the sea level is rising, are relying on imported packaged food and drink, which the first thing I saw was all of this waste that was being dumped on the beach and into the ocean. I sent, spent six months then, after Earth Race, living on this tiny island, working with the schools to develop a waste management system for this little island. We did a huge cleanup in month five and removed 56 tons of rubbish from that tiny island, which helped get them back down to zero waste so that they could keep up the system longer term. This time in Tonga was really transformative and set me up for the next project, which was setting up an organization called Pangaea Explorations that owns this amazing research vessel, Sea Dragon. The idea is to sail around the world to connect people with the ocean, to take scientists, filmmakers, artists, journalists, educators, product designers, all these people who need to get access to the ocean to monitor these critical challenges, bring their findings back to land, and ultimately create change. So as you can imagine, the last five years of sailing around the world on Sea Dragon have opened my eyes even further to everything that's happening in our oceans. And I'm going to run through some of those things now. Firstly, plastic. At the moment, around 8 million tons of plastic is entering our oceans every year. It's running down rivers, down waterways, and ending up in what we call gyres, these huge areas of plastic accumulation in the middle of our oceans. So our first project was to sail to these five subtropical oceanic gyres to find out if plastic really existed there. And we found it. We used this manta trawl to look for microplastics. And every time we pulled up that trawl, we found thousands of tiny fragments of plastic invisible to the naked eye, but there on the surface of the ocean. We even tested the waters through the Northwest Passage in the Arctic and there too found plastic. We started catching fish and found fragments of fish were being ingested, uh, sorry, fragments of plastic were being ingested by the fish, which can cause problems, um, can cause starvation and physical problems, but then I realized that there was something else going on. These plastic particles, they actually act like magnets for lots of toxics, persistent organic pollutants that exist in our oceans. Things like flame retardants, PCBs, pesticides, they all end up going down into our ocean, and then the plastic acts like a magnet and a carrier into the food chain. I was intrigued as to how this could be affecting us, given that humans are near the top of that food chain. With a group of girls last year, we crossed the Atlantic Ocean, looking exactly at that, toxics in the ocean and also in our own bodies. We tested our bodies for 35 chemicals. We found 29 of them, toxic ones, present in our bloods. I had a particularly high flame retardant chemical inside mine. That chemical is persistent. It will never, ever go. The only way I will lose it is potentially passing it on to a child. We're catching so many fish out of the ocean today 
that around 20,000 tuna are caught every 15 minutes globally. 70% of our planet is ocean, 80% of our oxygen comes from the ocean, and it's also responsible for the home for 90% of our living things. Every human being on our planet has the privilege to enjoy the benefits the ocean has to offer, but we also have the responsibility to love and protect it. This is not the time to be overwhelmed by all of the enormity of all of these challenges that I've just presented here tonight. It's time for us to act. Humanity is facing the biggest challenge that we've ever had to face. And we are the ones who have the opportunity to overcome it. Earthwatch and the scientists on this stage tonight are leading the way in doing exactly that, of turning these problems into real solutions. And so, without further ado, I would like to introduce our chair for the evening, Professor Martin Attrill. If there's one book that shows how attitudes have changed and why we are where we are now is perhaps this book that came out in 1955 called The Inexhaustible Sea. And this is just one quote in it. It says, nevertheless, someday men will learn that in its bounty the sea is inexhaustible. Now, this wasn't written by some politician or fisherman or journalist. It was written by perhaps the leading uh, fisheries institute in the world at Woods Hole in Massachusetts. So even in 1955, scientists believed that we could not exhaust the sea. We can exploit it as much as we wanted without um, problem. And so we did. And our desire for fish has been um, developed into um, extra aquaculture. And a lot of this aquaculture really impacts coastal systems, particularly if anyone's partial to king prawns. Most of the king prawns come from farms in the Far East, which were once mangroves or other habitats. Imagine that you've inherited from your parents a beautifully decorated house that's brilliantly designed to protect you from the elements, that's in a fantastic coastal, coastal location. It contributes uh, to your income, um, and it's something that your ancestors have always revered. Wouldn't you do what you could to protect that house and to pass it on in good condition to your own children? So if mangroves are as important as I've just described, if people depend on them um, as much as I've suggested, why is it that around the world these forest ecosystems are being destroyed and degraded? This woman here um, lives in Ghazi village in southern Kenya, and uh, like 76% of the other people in that village, she relies on mangrove fuel wood for her domestic use. And she, she uses on average just over two kilograms of that wood a day. Collecting it is really hard work. Um, the women, it's 96% of, uh, of the people who do the collecting are women. The women collect it in these bundles and they burn it um, on, frankly, very primitive and inefficient open fires. This use of the mangroves is not sustainable. Uh, it, it may have been in the past, but with population growth, it's no longer sustainable. It's not good for people. Uh, it's a dependence from which people need to be liberated. And if you doubt that, then look at the relationship between people's wealth and their dependence on mangrove fuel wood. These are data from across the globe where people have looked at case studies of communities living adjacent to these forests and measured the percentage of households in these communities that use fuel wood. So human beings, uh, back in 2009, these data are slightly out of date now, human beings were responsible for almost 10 billion tons of carbon being released into the atmosphere every year. And when that carbon goes up into the atmosphere, something very interesting and very important happens to it. 57% of that carbon disappears from the atmosphere. There's a magic disappearing trick. Um, this is vital for us because we know how serious climate change is at the moment. Without this disappearing trick, climate change would be running twice as, more than twice as fast. So what happens to that carbon? Well, uh, more, slightly more than half of that 57%, about 2.6 billion tonnes, goes into terrestrial ecosystems. It's sopped up by forests in particular. Um, the other half, or slightly under half, 2.2 billion tonnes, is absorbed into the ocean. And I want to follow up and, and think about where that absorption is going in this next slide. So what you can see here is four important key marine habitats. This is the deep ocean. These are, this is coastal shelf. This is estuaries, 
and this is vegetated uh, coastal habitat, so mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrasses. And one approach to this problem that people uh, certainly took maybe 20 years ago was just to look at the spatial extent of these habitats. So if we want to know which are the important habitats in the ocean um, for all sorts of ecological functioning, including carbon sequestration, then let's just look at their spatial extent. And if we do that, this, this is the picture that emerges. More than 80% of the ocean is, is deep ocean, is classified as deep ocean. About 14% are coastal shelves. There are the estuaries, just, just hanging in there at 0.5%. The vegetated coastal areas has disappeared. That's down at 0.04% of spatial extent. So if we were guided by that, then we would simply ignore these coastal habitats. But to do that would be making a very serious mistake. And it's something that we've discovered really over the last 20 years, and partly uh, with the help of Earthwatch support. When we look at the percentage efficiency of these habitats in capturing and storing carbon, a very different picture emerges. So now you can see that mangroves um, and vegetated ecosystems are about 22 to 24 times more efficient per unit area than the deep ocean. So if you're interested in bang for bucks, if you're interested in value per unit area of investing in uh, marine ecosystems for carbon storage, then you really want to look at these uh, coastal ecosystems. To look at a mangrove forest and measure it as, as carbon that you can see above ground is very misleading because the proportion of carbon in these forests um, above and below ground looks something like this. More than 90% of the carbon is buried um, below the roots. So, in our site in Kenya, uh, we've spent a lot of time digging holes. It's always one of the favorite tasks for our Earthwatch volunteers. But that task has been very important because we've discovered uh, some, some, some salient facts. We've discovered that um, we can go down three meters, that's as far as we can safely go, um, and we haven't hit bed bedrock. So there's an awful lot of carbon down there, and some of those plots uh, are approaching three thousand tons of carbon per hectare. That's an extraordinary density of carbon. Many, many people, many people have uh, contributed to and benefited from this work. We've had more than 250 Earthwatch volunteers working with us in Ghazi from uh, more than 40 different countries, working with a whole range of, uh, of, of different universities and of course with uh, Kenyan researchers all the time and the Kenyan government. Because this work is recognized by the Kenyan government as an example of uh, good practice in climate change adaptation, and because it's also recognized by the United Nations, it's achieved quite a high profile now, and we're often being con contacted by other communities along East Africa to say, look, can you come and help us establish similar schemes in our mangroves? And our answer to that is, yes, we'd love to do that. Um, we're looking forward to continuing support from Earthwatch um, to help us to do just that. And our intention is to help liberate people from those, uh, those dependencies which are there for necessity and help celebrate those dependencies which are birthright, their birthright, like the mangroves. Coral reefs are truly one of the most spectacular ecosystems on the planet. They're home to many different species. And they're unique in that they're, um, the coral reef ecosystem is built by animals. So these are the corals that are building the foundation of the ecosystem. Most other ecosystems around the planet are build, built by plants. And so they are truly a unique ecosystem. In addition to being incredibly beautiful and spectacular and enjoyable to visit, they also provide numerous important ecosystem goods and services to communities around the world. They're first and foremost known for their uh, ability to support a huge amount of biodiversity. So despite the fact that coral reefs occupy an area of the planet that is about the size of the country of France, they're home to about 25% of the ocean's marine species. So they are the single most biodiverse ecosystem in the ocean. Coral reefs are also important because they provide physical protection to coastlines around the world, um, specifically in the tropics. This is because corals are actively building reefs. They're laying down calcium carbonate or limestone underneath their soft tissue. And as they do that, they grow up towards the sun and they create these massive barriers or geologic features that you can see from space. And these geologic features protect the coastlines from the battering forces of wave energy, storms, hurricanes, tsunamis, cyclones, and, um, uh, and all other kinds of, of large storm events. 
<clears throat> They're also important for generating a large amount of revenue. So many tourists, many people like you and I are um, willing to pay money to visit coral reefs and to interact with, with these spectacular ecosystems. They're also important from a fisheries perspective. So many tropical island nations around the world are dependent entirely on uh, reef-associated fisheries. These are fish that are derived from the reef ecosystem and not pelagic species like tuna. Um, this is, of course, problematic when you consider many of the species shown here, which are parrotfish, which happen to be very important for um, maintaining reef health, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So uh, this encompasses a large amount of the work that my lab at Scripps Institution of Oceanography is focused on. We're primarily interested in determining the effects of various anthropogenic disturbances on coral reefs, um, understanding how humans interact with reefs and how that changes the structure of reefs. Um, we're interested in understanding how reefs look or how they exist in the absence of humans. Um, and to do this, we travel to very remote locations in the middle of the Pacific that have never had local human populations. And this provides a baseline for us to um, better evaluate the potential for these reef ecosystems today. So um, my research, my lab has been focusing on addressing this question by bubbling CO2 into little aquaria and looking at the response of a variety of both calcifying and non-calcifying species to elevated CO2. Um, we're really interested in being able to see if we can determine how reef communities in particular are going to shift in the future as the oceans become more acidic. What we've been able to show just in summary is that many of the reef building species, whether it be corals or coral and algae or other important calcifiers, um, are generally negatively affected by ocean acidification while some of the fleshy species, which act in a more bioerosive capacity, are actually positively affected by ocean acidification. And this is because things like fleshy algae or seaweeds actually use CO2 for photosynthesis. So they take up CO2 all day, day long during the process of photosynthesis, and that actually raises the pH. And so <clears throat> while the calcifiers are negatively affected, the fleshy species are, are positively affected, and that suggests that in the future, we may see reef communities shifting from being these calcium carbonate, you know, dominating reef building communities to ones that are actually dissolving or eroding away. Of course, um, this will be determined by whether or not these species can acclimate or adapt over time. So these are all based on short-term experiments and also, um, also determined on whether or not we can come up with ways of potentially mitigating this issue. There's a new trend in popular media suggesting that seaweeds may actually be able to mitigate the negative effects of ocean acidification on reef building organisms and other calcifiers. Um, again, specifically because these seaweeds are taking up CO2 during the daytime, changing the carbonate chemistry in a way that might buffer the negative effects of OA, um, of ocean acidification. Um, so that sums up the work that I do kind of focusing on anthropogenic disturbances, at least um, a brief overview. And I'm going to shift now to just briefly mention the work that we do on remote coral reefs. And so <clears throat> we believe it's really important to be able to understand what reefs look like in the absence of people. What did reefs look like 5,000 years ago? Um, and to do this, we, we can take essentially a virtual time machine back through time by going to some islands that have never had local human populations. <clears throat> islands that are so remote um, and virtually inaccessible um, to ask some questions, simple questions. What do reefs look like in the absence of people? And is there evidence that these remote reefs are, are suffering from some of these global change impacts such as ocean acidification or warming? And that reefs in the absence of lo local impacts are actually really thriving today. Um, this suggests that potentially management at the local level by managing some of those local impacts, we might be able to increase the resilience of these systems to global change. So while it is good to set aside some of these really pristine locations, it's also important to um, move forward and think about how we're gonna interact or how we interact with the marine environment. And so this is why I'm really excited about the future collaboration that we have with Earth Earthwatch, which is specifically looking, kind of encompassing all of the topics that I just discussed. It's looking at the sustainability and impacts of seaweed farming in the tropics. So seaweed farming 
farming is a very large industry, specifically for the product carrageenan, which is a cell wall polysaccharide. It's a thickening agent that's used in many different human products, ranging from yogurt to sour cream, whipped cream, um, coconut milk, almond milk, whatnot. Um, so a whole variety of human products to make that, that smooth, thick consistency. It's a multi-million dollar industry. Um, and this, this seaweed farming industry has really been promoted as being an alternative livelihood to um, destructive fishing in the tropics. So many people used to be out um, blowing up the reefs to catch fish. Now they can actually generate money by having a seaweed farm and use that money to purchase food instead of um, destroying the reefs. Yet there's been very little research on the topic. And so we have no idea what these seaweed farms are doing to the local ecology um, and or um, how sustainable they are for the future. I'm not the first person to realize the sort of magical beauty of coral reefs. Um, this may be slightly better than average uh, scientist, uh, Alfred Wallace, recognized the importance of reefs back as far as 1869, and his colleague, of course, Charles Darwin, also recognized that these systems were relatively important. And as coral biologists, we like to grab Darwin as our first coral biologist, and he's on our side. Um, Where Wallace sort of uh, wax lyrical about the amazing biodiversity of coral reefs, what Darwin really noticed was that coral reefs represent these amazing physical structures, really complex, and that was the key to their success. Not only do they produce these big physical structures that we've seen some beautiful images, actually I'm very jealous about where Jennifer works, um, but these big structures are self-building structures. They build the habitat themselves. What a fantastic system. And these drive the high biodiversity, the food productivity, and support about half a billion people around the planet, a number which is going to increase dramatically. One of the big threats to coral reefs globally are the short-term shocks that sometimes the world experiences through El Ninos and other uh, climatic events. The last big recorded El Nino was actually in 1998, and during that six to eight week period, 16% of the world's coral reefs were killed. And remember how many people depended on these coral reefs for their food. In that, that number goes up to 90% in some areas, and what's killing these corals is just a slight increase in temperature, maybe just two degrees. And this is where I take you through a journey from throughout the Seychelles. We first start off with Desroches, uh, an atoll about 240 kilometers southwest uh, of Mahé. From Desroches, we take a, a quick plane journey over a few years, actually. It's not it's not during the same trip, to the island called Silhouette, a beautiful granitic Jurassic Park-like island, which is just north of Mahé. And from there, we go to this magical island of Curious. And Curious is the focus of much of my research, and I will be talking to you about that later on. But Curious is a marine park. It's a marine park which is effectively managed and is successful. And I want to make that point very clear, because it's to the um, credit of the Seychelles government in protecting that environment. We call this search for survivors because throughout these areas, what we've actually done, and thank you to the volunteers who put lots of uh, effort into this, we've looked at 315 different sites around these, um, uh, these different islands, 22,000 data points. And what we actually did was ask a really simple question. What was the age structure of corals in these different reef systems? Because if those corals are older than a 10 to 15 years, i.e. have been there since the bleaching event in 98, then of course they're tolerant. If they're present, they're obviously there. And what we found was really exciting, actually, that there is a section of the coral community that were much older than the 10 or 15 years and have clearly survived that 98 event. They're the tolerant. Are they the future of coral reefs? Unfortunately, the other part of um, the, the, the equation are those corals that there was no evidence of survival. And unfortunately, these are the corals which are the most physically complex, the branching corals. Now, these support the biodiversity, and that's quite a drastic problem. And what we see when we carried out the experiments, we see an uplift. Rather than these corals dying out very quickly, their tolerance has changed. They become much, much more tolerant and less vulnerable. Fantastic. A potential management solution. So we went back out to Curios, and we mapped out the different habitats. Um, the staff did the beautiful green seagrass beds, and the volunteers volunteered for the mangrove lagoon. That's the pitch I'm taking tonight anyway. 
Um, and during those, in those environments, we looked at the pH. And it's one of the most exciting eureka moments that we actually found. When the volunteers did uh, drive the, by mutiny, the staff, into the mangrove systems, we were astonished to find not just the small corals, but the big, branching, architecturally complex corals. These corals living in waters of 34, 35 degrees, acid and pH environments of 2100, growing actively. These environments may be a bank of genetic biodiversity which could seed reefs of the future. Now finally, what's the point of scientists doing all this research if it doesn't make a difference in society? And actually, in, uh, over the last 100 years or so, scientists have never been really good at making a big difference in society. And that's where, of course, a volunteer organization like Earthwatch really um, is worth its weight in gold. It forces us to actually look at the research we do and try to make a difference and impact in society. And how do we do that? Well, there's two ways in which we can do that. There's the legal policy and management route, changing the way in which politicians view our planet and bringing our research into the political framework to make a difference. And of course, there's raising education awareness and getting the question out here, just like this seminar is doing, hopefully, for you tonight. In terms of the legal status, what are we doing in the Seychelles? Well, we're having, we're having a dualed approach. We're focused at the national level, of course, and we're engaged through our social science team um, with the national management agencies, SMPA, and we're incorporating um, our ideas of these ecological refuge and these banks of genetic biodiversity into national plans. That's, the, that's one of the points. But we're also working at an international level. Now, one of the unique things about Curious, because it has those mangroves and those future environments, is actually they're just about the perfect underwater laboratory. Um, I had a question for Professor Huxham. I was, I'm really impressed with the carbon uh, credit work that you've done around mangroves. And I wondered if, um, like me, anyone was interested in whether there's an opportunity to offset some of my carbon through your project. Thank you very much. I'll give you the bank account details <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Actually, the, the biggest challenge, it's interesting that lots and lots of people are interested in this, partly because they see an opportunity for conservation in their areas, and partly because there's, there's a lot of discussion in, in the scientific literature and elsewhere. But the, the real challenge, especially for a scientist like me, who's very naive when it comes to dealing with international financial flows, is dealing with the uncertainty in the carbon market. And um, it's been a bit of an eye-opener to discover just how fluctuating that is. There's, there's no Swahili word for carbon, so trying to explain to our friends and colleagues in the village that, you know, I can't promise them that we'll sell all that carbon. And if we can sell it, it might be half the price that we sold last year is a, is a, is a major challenge. James Burrell from Queen Mary University. So we're quite familiar with, with sort of tropical forests and how long they might take to regenerate, you know, for forests to come back, perhaps tropical forests 100 years or something like that. In the context of mangroves, if you had an area that was cleared, how long might it take to have to regenerate a fully functioning mangrove ecosystem? Perhaps wh whoever thinks they're best place to answer. Mark? <laughs> well, we, we, um, one, of the, one of the first questions that we asked when we first arrived in Ghazi was whether it was possible to restore degraded areas of mangroves. And these were two areas in particular, close to the village, where there'd been a, an extensive forest and the forest had been removed by, for industrial purposes, probably as a tax break or illegally, um, many years before, about 35 years before, and there'd been absolutely no regeneration in those areas. And we had no idea whether we'd be able to restore those areas. And it, one of the, the real benefits of working with Earthwatch is that they're an organization that are willing to take a chance on that kind of speculative science. So it's a long-term project. These trees grow quite slowly, at least in that site. And we really didn't know if it would work at all. And what we discovered was that once you remove the trees, um, there are all sorts of chemical changes in the sediment. In particular, there's uh, de deposition of salt. So it, the simplest mechanism is that you get very intense sunshine that evaporates seawater and it leaves lots and lots of salt. So you, you end up with these salt pans where nothing can grow. And you can reverse that if you, if you um, spend a lot of time nurturing trees and planting them in nurseries and getting them through critical phases in their lifestyle 
life, life stage. So that original experiment that was started about 12 years ago, now um, we can't run the experiment anymore because it's been so successful in reseeding our control areas that we don't have an experiment anymore. So in answer, that kind of area you can restore it, but it takes a long time. If the area isn't changed chemically in that way, then mangroves can grow extremely fast. So they can grow more than a meter a year in, in, in productive good areas. So they can, they're very resilient and they can re recover very fast. 